Greetings. As we gather together during the season of Lent, we find ourselves focusing on the worth of, of worship. We think about how we live in this world, which is the way in which we worship our God. Our theme for this morning is rethinking religion, rethinking the worth of worship. We'll begin by singing our opening hymn, hymn 912, Open Lovely Doors. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In response to our forgiveness, we sing stanzas one and three of him 653 lord to you i make confession
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and to do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this morning comes to us today from Exodus chapter 20. This section of scripture will serve as the basis for our sermon. The sermon's themes are is God's words, a life filled with love, life filled by love. We read. And go and God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residents in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We'll continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. I believe we're, yeah, Psalm 19.
Our second reading for this morning comes to us today from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In it we see that, that God, he has outsmarted and he outstrengthens the world by what the world considers foolish and weakness, but that's found in Jesus. We read, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdoms of, wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel acclamation this morning comes to us today from John chapter 2. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Our gospel today comes to us from John chapter 2. In it we see Jesus having a zeal for God's house. We read, When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove out from the temple courts both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of our Lord. Please be seated uh, as we continue with our hymn of the day. Hymn 558, Salvation Unto Us Has Come. Please note that we'll be singing stanzas 1 through 6 and 10.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you love someone? How do you love someone? If you search that on the internet, you'll find hundreds of answers. And you don't have to look too far. Many of those answers are put to song and people sing about it. How do you love someone? And whether or not you've done the research or not, guess what? You have to provide an answer for that. Because on a regular daily basis, that question comes across your plate. How do you love someone? Whether it be parents or family members, whether it be teachers or friends, you ask or answer that question, whether you even think about it or not, how do you love someone? Today in our lesson, God gives us words on how we are to love someone. And more than answering the question of how do you love someone, God in our lesson reveals to us how we can answer an even greater question, which is how do you love God? God's word, a life filled with love, better a life filled by love. Our lesson for the day is Exodus 20, it's the Ten Commandments. Now I'm guessing that you've probably heard of the Ten Commandments. You might not be able to put them all in a row, and I'm not going to quiz you, but you've heard of them, right? The commands that God lays before his people on which they should do. And you'd be right in saying that. But what I found as I was studying this past week to be really quite amazing is the manner in which God gives these commands to his people. Do you know how God gives the commands to the people? If you've never read Exodus 19, then you should read it because it's quite astonishing. And the way in which God presents these commands to these peoples is that he speaks it to them from the top of a mountain. This is the way the Bible records God speaking the commands to his people, the Israelites. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain, a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. And then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Can you imagine be being at Mount Sinai on that day? A mountain consumed by smoke like a furnace, shaking with trumpets, and God speaks to his people. Terrifying. No, no doubt, terrifying. In fact, the, the people thought the same thing, because after our lesson, after God speaks to them, this is what they say in response. Speak to us yourself, as they talk to Moses, and we will listen to you. But to have God speak to us, ah, don't do that or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that, you, that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. The people heard God speak. They saw this sign. I'm sure they felt underneath their feet just how awesome and amazing God is, and it terrified them. And even as amazing as the presentation of the ten words is to the people of God, when you read them, you might find yourself saying, even more amazing is the words themselves. The very things that God outlines and lays out for his people in our lesson this morning. The Ten Commandments. As you have probably come to know them, they're very similar, written in Exodus 20. Sure, there's some explanation for certain commandments, like the first commandment and the third commandment and the 
second commandment, and there's punishments attached to them, but they read pretty much the way that you learn them, for the most part, right? You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, workers, or wife. Sounds pretty familiar to us, and rightfully so. It's an important part of what God says to his people. And in all honesty, it's extremely helpful for us as Christians. <laughs> because as Christians, as creatures of the Almighty God, the truth is, is that he deserves rightfully our service and love. And so how do you love God? Well, if you listen to what is said here, God says you love him by keeping his commandments. So how do you love God? By doing what is good. And in these words, God outlines what is good for his people. And not just for his people, but as we read in the New Testament, we see that this is not just for the Israelites, but this is spread out for all people. This is what is good for them. To love God. And also to love their neighbor. That's the way Jesus summarizes the Ten Commandments in the New Testament. Catechism kids should know this, right? Jesus said this is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second greatest commandment. So loving God and loving neighbor. When you look at the commands and you break them down, it, it becomes quite challenging to find yourself filling your life with love for God and also love for your neighbor. Because if we are to truly love God, what should we do? We should, the Bible says, love him with everything that we have, which means have no other gods beside him. And that doesn't just mean making idols and bowing down and worshiping them. It means allowing anything to take God's place in our hearts. That means the really awesome things of family should not get in the way of us loving God. That means the really awesome and amazing things that God has placed in this life for us, the material possessions, should not take priority over serving God. It means that when we think about our life, God is at the center. And that everything that we do should be centered around loving Him. And He shouldn't be an afterthought. And to the things that we do on a regular day-to-day -day basis, we should love Him. We shouldn't wander into sin because we should also fear Him. And when things get difficult in our life, we shouldn't go around grasping at straws, thinking and hoping that maybe this will work or that will work. We should trust Him. We should love, fear and love and trust in God above all things. That's what God calls us to. And not only that, but that, that, that also means how do we speak to Him? How do we interact with Him? When we address Him, we should not use His name carelessly or worthlessly. When we think about how do we, how do we understand who he is, we should address his word with honor and respect and use his words as a part of our everyday life. So I ask you, how much love do you have for God? When you think about your day today, how much love do you have for God? Do you even think about him? Do you find yourselves having him be an afterthought to your every day? Do you find yourself filling your life with focus on the things of this world rather than on his word and what he has prepared for you for eternity? If you're like, like me, the truth is, is, yeah, oftentimes, sometimes we just fail to love God the way we should. 
And loving God is the very first step in for us to understand how we are to even love our neighbor. God, in our lesson, outlines how it is to love our neighbor. Right? We should care about their position. Whether they be parents or grandparents, we should care about that. As children, we should allow the, our parents' words to set heavy upon us, maybe even more important than our friends. As, as individuals, we should care about and value the lives of our neighbor. To the point of where we use our words and our hands and our abilities to build them up so that they can understand and know what it is to be loved by somebody else. We should value and cherish the relationships that God has placed in our lives, husbands and wives. We should value and care about our neighbor's possessions. That includes their name. And we should do this all while not only outwardly carrying it out, but more importantly, inwardly with a pure heart. And this isn't just a checklist of things to do. This is what we are to do because this is what God says is good for all people. How do you love someone? When you look and you see what God lays out for his people, and then you look at your life, you can ask the question, have I really truly loved someone the way that God has asked me to? Think about it. Have I really truly loved God the way that he has asked me to? Have I really truly loved my neighbor in the way that he has asked me to? And if we're honest with ourselves, the answer is no. We haven't loved God the way that he rightfully deserves. And in all honesty, we haven't loved our neighbors the way that we should because oftentimes our love is done out of selfish motives in order to get something back in response. Or it's done in such a way as to, well, cause the least frustration. It's done in such a way as to benefit me and not them. And it certainly isn't necessarily one way conditional, unconditional all the time. Sometimes we get frustrated with loving the people in our lives. And when that happens, we see that it's a life filled with our love that really isn't all that loving. And this is why it's really important, I think, at least to understand the whole of these words. Because at the very beginning, when God speaks to these Israelites, he says something that is truly, well, it, it's perspective setting. It helps us understand them all. Listen to the very beginning of our lesson. So God is speaking to the people from the mountain, and it says this, And God spoke all these words, and this is the very first verse after that. It says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. That sets the tone for everything that comes after it. That sets the tone for us as we understand how we are to love in this world. The truth is, is loving in this world has more to do with understanding God's love for us than it is a translation of our love towards other people. Because this list here is not a list of checking off and making sure that we've done all these things. Because the truth is, is even if we were looking at this as a list, it's a wonderful thing that is good, but it fails. It fails to make us or place us where we need to be before our God. Because when we look at this list, we find ourselves thinking, I have not loved the way that I should. But when you understand that God comes to the Israelites and he rescues them from slavery, and that's not like a little rescue, he legitimately takes Egypt on all by himself, and he causes his people to be escorted out of Egypt, thereby delivering and clearing the way for them. And then he comes to the mountain and says, here's some things that are good for you. That changes the perspective. At least, I think it does. Because it helps us understand that, that what God has placed before the Israelites is something that happens after he has saved them. 
And then you think about that with yourself. God's love for you is not dependent on how well you check this list off. God's love for you is one of one-way, unconditional love poured out for you most clearly through the face of our Savior, Jesus. And when you understand that your relationship with God is not based upon the things that you're doing here, but rather on His commitment to you, holy smokes, that makes it a whole lot easier to say, I want to love God. I want to love Him. And I want, to, I want to use his name and honor his name and I want to hear about his word and I want to then go out and love other people so that they can understand and know what it means to really be loved by God. When we understand that God's grace is the foundation for our love and service to God, then we are freed up to do the very things that God has called us to do. You know it. From 1 John, right? We love because he first loved us. The truth is, is before God's love, we were slaves to sin. Just like the Israelites, slaves in Egypt, God brought us out of that. Through his love and through his grace, through Jesus, he has rescued us from what our sins rightfully deserve. And because he has rescued us, he has given us the ability to live for and so now we know what love is. We know what it is to, to experience love. And, and that love that God has poured out on us has moved us then to then want and go and share that love with others. We are freed up to love God and to love our neighbor. All the while knowing that God's love for us is a constant. And we know that to be true because of Jesus, but also because of the things that he does for us. If ever you wonder, if ever you, you worry or doubt that God's love is there for you, think, think to your baptism. Where God has said specifically to you individually, you are mine. Think about the Lord's Supper, where God specifically says, Jesus comes to us and says, here is my body, here is my blood. For forgiveness, it is yours. And think about what Jesus was willing to do for you on the cross. As we find ourselves in the Lenten season, that is our focus. Our focus is on Jesus loving us, enduring sorrow and suffering for us so that, so that we can be filled. And know, to know what love really is, is to know Jesus. And so as we find ourselves listening to what God says is good, Knowing Jesus and knowing what God has done, that he has rescued us, causes us to desire to love God and love our neighbor, not because we have to, but because we desire to. Because we know that our God loved us, and that's how we express our love to him, to thank him for everything that he's done for us. So how do you love someone? Well... Know God. Know God and his salvation and, and know his redemption. And that will fuel us and fill us so that we then can go out and love selflessly to the people in our lives. So that we can value them because we've been valued. So that we can, we can look after the things that are theirs because, well, God has taken care of us. So that we can encourage them to fight against temptation and things that are bad because well, that's what God does for us. How do you love someone? Well, it's only possible through the love of our God. It's only possible through the love of our Savior, Jesus. As you continue to walk this Lenten journey, think about that question. How do you love someone? And then... When you think about how do you love someone, don't think about your service, but think about God's service to you. Think about Jesus living and dying for you because there is love. May that love strengthen you. May that love give you peace. And may that love give you hope for an eternity that is yours in heaven. Amen. Please stand.
May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may that guard our hearts and our minds through faith in Jesus. We'll continue our worship this morning by confessing our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one. Please be seated as we continue with the prayer of the church. We'll, re we'll pray that prayer responsively. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path that you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion. To all who preach and teach your word, fill them with love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the heart of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and open the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body and mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and the dying. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers spoken and silent and answer them in your wisdom and grace. We'll now continue with our thank offering.
please stand as we continue with uh, sacrament. The Lord be with you. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in, your, though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood, and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when we will receive, when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close our service today by singing our final hymn for this morning, which is hymn 407, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Greetings again, kids. You may leave and head downstairs for Sunday school. Things to, things to note, uh, just to kind of put on your calendar. Uh, there's March calendars in the in your mailboxes. There's some budget sheets if you're interested in that on the back table. If you need, if we need more. Let me know. Let Mrs. Schlomer know. Um, and then forward in Christ will being handed will be handed out by the ushers this evening. Um, there's some more information about the CEF back there. Youth rally information um, back on the back table if if anybody needs it or you can go online and get it. Um, and that's that's pretty much all the announcements that I have. Um, for you. Oh, and lilies. Um, I forgot to do this last week, but there's a sign-up sheet for Easter lilies, um, and they wanted them ordered last week. Um, the places that we're, we're looking at getting them from, actually, I talked to them on the phone. They ordered them, and they said, you can still get them, but we'll just have to run it through and as long as they have supplies. So if you want Easter lilies, I, it might seem a little early, but it's really not because Easter's in March. Um, so um, Easter lilies, sign up sheet in the back. There's also Christmas for kids stuff. Easter, thank you, Easter for kids things to think about um, the 23rd, I believe Saturday the 23rd. Um, with all that being said, as always, God's blessings to you as you leave this place and you serve him. <laughs>